We want to now bring you the story about the emerging markets because they are front and center, not only at this weekend's G20 meetings in South Korea. Our Peter Cook actually spoke to Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner about them. But the world's changed dramatically, and it's very important that we're discussing things with China, with India, with Brazil, with the emerging market economies all around the world that are growing so rapidly and are going to be such a promising sort of future source of future growth. Our next guest says emerging markets are among the most attractive investment opportunities in an uncertain new normal world. And with that phrase, you know I'm talking about someone from PIMCO. Ramin Talou is an emerging markets portfolio manager uh, at that firm. I mean, I want to start quickly with the G20 here. Uh, the, the lack of, you know, real rules coming out about uh, competitive devaluation or uh, account balances. Does that change your outlook for opportunities in some of the emerging markets? I think in the near term, it means more of the same trend that we've seen with uh, continued pressure on the dollar and more investment flows into emerging markets and into the euro. Um, I think what the G20 accomplished was turning down the temperature a bit on the currency war story, which uh, the story two weeks ago from the IMF World Bank meetings was a lack of agreement. Now we have some framework that still needs to be discussed and, and developed um, to reduce the tensions in international currency markets. So reduce the tensions a bit, but does that also reduce the likelihood that we will see more attempts, more interventions, or more, uh, you know, withholding tax mm -hmm. on uh, foreign bond? Holders. No, I think that we're going to continue to see the, the story play out with different countries trying to adapt measures that they see as in their own interests. So what we didn't have at this G20 was a comprehensive agreement that, addre that addressed the underlying tensions, the underlying differences in economic right. performance and the differences in policies that are driving these currency movements. Well, I want to talk to you about the specifics, particularly in some of those markets and opportunities you're finding. We're back now with Ramin Tului, an emerging markets portfolio manager for PIMCO. We've been talking about the tremendous opportunity you're finding in the new normal among emerging markets there. Uh, debt levels seemingly are lower, opportunities uh, for investment higher there. Now, versus emerging market equities, you say bonds are the way, to, easier way, less volatility to access some of that growth. Mm -hmm. But it may get more expensive for foreigners to buy into some of those local markets. We've seen that with some of these new capital controls in countries like Thailand, in Brazil. Do you expect the price, essentially, of investing there to continue to go up? Mm -hmm. Well, the important context is that many investors have very low allocations to emerging market bonds. So while they're familiar with taking currency exposure to emerging markets through emerging market equities, investments in local bonds are very small, even though the yields on these bonds are high relative to industrial market. And like equities, they benefit from currency appreciation, right. which we expect as investors allocate more and more of their capital to emerging markets. Now. Of course, new taxes, new capital controls have to be factored into the return that we expect on emerging market bonds and emerging market equities. But the fact is that currently investors are under allocated to local currency denominated emerging market bonds. So you don't think it'll discourage investment. If anything, you're betting on further appreci appreciation of some of the currencies in, in Thailand and in Brazil? Ultimately, differential economic performance is going to drive the valuation of currencies. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing in a world where emerging markets are growing more quickly, have lower levels of debt, and are the globe's creditors, they're going to be the destinations for capital in the coming years. And we've seen that in the record inflows into emerging markets this year. And so ultimately, those fundamentals will drive investment returns, divide, uh, drive emerging market currency appreciation. Um, even as policymakers seek to resist currency appreciation in the in the short term. Well, we're looking at images of Brazil. Um, we are staring down the elections, the runoff elections that are supposed to be happening over this next weekend. Depending on the outcome, do you expect any more or any less investment in infrastructure and issuance of new bonds? Mm -hmm. I think that whoever wins in this uh, election, we're going to see a continued high investment in infrastructure, basically building out Brazil as a platform to export the commodities that a, a growing world needs. Now, this is very different than historically in emerging markets, and particularly in, in a country like Brazil, where elections could really represent a sea change in policy. We think that here the primary story is one of continuity, 
um, and, and either candidate, whichever candidate is ultimately elected, will continue to make these investments to expand Brazil as, a, as an export platform for the world. And to be clear, when you're talking about emerging markets, you're talking about the BRIC nations, the Brazil's, the Russia's, the India's, the China's. You're avoiding Eastern Europe, or you're not as enthusiastic about it. So emerging markets is, is a, is, is a broad-based term that, as you point out, highlight, uh, uh, covers over lots of differentiation. So when we use the shorthand of emerging markets, we're primarily primarily talking about the BRIC nations, systemically important emerging markets. Of course, there are, there are parts of the European periphery and other emerging markets that have higher levels of debt and therefore less attractive destinations for investment.